Right. So this is conceptual domination or conceptual engineering, the case of conspiracy theories by Matt Shield. Please, Matt, take it away. Thanks so much, Em, and uh, thanks so much for, for having me. I'm really looking forward to discussing these issues with everyone. Um, so I'll just jump right into it. So the debate between generalists and particularists that we've heard quite a bit about in uh, the talks, on the face of it, turns on this question of how we define the term or concept conspiracy theory. And so it makes sense then that we would want to turn to our best current metaphilosophical work on the very project of conceptual analysis to help us situate this debate. And that is what um, M. Julia Napolitano and Kevin Reuter have done in their recent paper, uh, What is a Conspiracy Theory? And they reinterpret the philosophical literature on conspiracy theories, and in particular, the debate between generalists and particularists in light of this new metaphilosophical work. So for example, they argue that on the one hand, we have claims made by the more, uh, well, by the particularist camp, like Cody, Basham, and Antith, that the concept conspiracy theory should be ameliorated by eliminating the evaluative component of the concept, the negative mark that's associated with it, and the concept should instead be treated as neutral. Napolitano and Reuter, on the other hand, argue that the best strategy for defining conspiracy theory is to engineer or ameliorate the evaluative concept to encode specific epistemic deficiencies. So in other words, we should engineer the concept of conspiracy theory so that it's um, necessarily linked to the concept, to the content uh, epistemic deficiency or negative epistemic mark. And the reason we should pursue this kind of engineering or amelioration project is that we should aim in their view for continuity with ordinary talk and thought um, to allow us to study particularly uh, empirically through social science and empirical psychology, this phenomenon that's of public interest. So that's the reason we should opt for their engineered concept um, over this opposing particularist camp. And then in their paper, they give various studies that seem to show that the ordinary concept conspiracy theory is indeed evaluative in the specific sense of signaling epistemic deficiency. So if the goal is to engineer a concept that's gonna be continuous with ordinary talk and thought, then their concept works best and so we should opt for it. Now, I'm gonna make a couple of arguments in this talk. So the first one is that I think that Napolitano and Reuter risk misconstruing the particularist camp and earlier kindred uh, views to particularism. Uh, on my reading, what these views are aiming to do is actually diagnose discourse around the concept conspiracy theory as a site of what I've recently elsewhere called conceptual domination. So in one sense, I think I'm very much on board with Napolitano and Reuter's invocation of the conceptual engineering literature. I just think that um, they're not quite using it in the right way. My second argument is going to be that this misconstrual on their part isn't just an idle issue. I think it leads to problems for their own conceptual engineering project. And more generally, I think we arrive at a kind of um, uh, more illustrative lesson here that as philosophers, we should be very wary or circumspect about conceptual engineering projects where the target concept is a site of what I'm calling conceptual domination. Now, I wanna signal right at the top here that this doesn't mean that a project like Napolitano and Reuters is doomed to fail, uh, but it does mean that I think it faces serious obstacles that they don't, but should take into account. Okay, so let me say a little bit about this notion of conceptual domination. So the recent explosion in interest among philosophers in the topic of conceptual engineering and what's also sometimes referred to as conceptual ethics turns on this idea that as philosophers, it doesn't seem like we're primarily engaged in a descriptive project where we're trying to capture how a concept is in fact used and understood. Instead, what we're 
doing for the most part, it seems, at least if you're partial to this notion of philosophers as conceptual engineers, what it seems like philosophers are in fact doing is saying that we should understand a given concept in a certain way in light of our ends, our various ends and commitments, regardless of how we may in fact understand the concept or may in fact currently use it. Now, on the one hand, I'm very sympathetic to this literature and I've even written a little bit on it um, uh, in, in trying to flesh out kind of the notion of conceptual engineering. Um, but I also think that it has some, has some problems. And one thing that I criticized is that I think it's shot through with what in my recent paper I call the inquiry assumption. And this feels very uh, kind of absurd and presumptuous, but I'm gonna, I think this is just the fastest way to do it. I'm gonna quote myself here. Um, so, and this is what the inquiry assumption is according to that recent paper. When speakers claim we should think or talk about a concept in a particular way, they do so, it's widely assumed in the conceptual engineering and ethics literature, because speakers are convinced that this is the correct or best view of the concept and are thus motivated by and committed to the goal of arriving at the correct or the best view of this concept. And in the broadest strokes, the thesis of my paper is that this inquiry assumption is misguided. It's the result of philosophers projecting an all too idealized version of themselves into instances of conceptual dispute. And that when we look at actual real world examples of conceptual dispute, um, things get a lot more complicated and the inquiry assumption uh, perhaps rarely holds. So let me give you an example. I think it'll be helpful to have something uh, specific to, to work with and to draw out the idea. So I give the example in the paper of David Plunkett and Tim Sundell's very influential 2013 paper on metalinguistic negotiation. And they describe this exchange in the paper uh, between two speakers concerning the concept torture. The first speaker using in the back of their mind a definition from the UN says that waterboarding is torture. And a second speaker using a definition from the early and mid 2000s from the US Department of Justice during the Bush administration and drawn specifically from the infamous torture memos claims that waterboarding is not torture. So here's how they describe this exchange. Even if we suppose that our two speakers mean different things by the word torture, as evidenced by the fact that they have different definitions in mind, it's clear that we've not exhausted the normative and evaluative work to be done here. After all, in the context of discussions about the moral or legal issues surrounding the treatment of prisoners, there's a substantive question about which definition is better. So Plunkett and Sundell's speakers, they explain, communicate that their preferred, quote, usage of the concept is the one appropriate to those moral or legal discussions, end quote. So in other words, whether we call this metalinguistic negotiation, conceptual engineering, what's going on in their reading of this case is that we have two speakers who have different views of the concept in question or have different concepts in mind, and they're advocating for which one is more appropriate to the relevant moral or legal discussions. So that's who should win the negotiation or whose engineered concept should be preferred. But I point out in the paper that um, things look very different when we look at the real world counterpart of um, at least one of these speakers views, especially the second one. So the second speaker is the one who has the US Department of Justice early and mid 2000s definition of torture in mind, which came from the infamous torture memos of the Bush administration, as I mentioned. So here's legal philosopher and theorist David Lubon and his um, subsequent testimony to Congress on the torture memos. The interrogation or torture memos, Lubon explains, fall far short of professional standards of candid advice and independent judgment. They involve a selective and in places deeply eccentric reading of the law. The memos cherry pick sources of evidence that back their conclusions and leave out sources of law that do not. They read as if they were reverse engineered to reach a predetermined outcome, that is approval of waterboarding and the other CIA techniques. So in other words, I think what we see here from Lubon's testimony, if we accept it, and let's just, of course, we can argue about it if we, if, if folks want to, but uh, let's just kind of take it for granted uh, for the sake of discussion for now. Um, what this seems to reveal is that although Plunkett and Sundell were assuming that the speaker, their hypothetical speaker who's channeling this definition is a genuine inquirer in that they want to engineer the concept that's best 
and correct in light of the relevant moral and legal discussions. In fact, what Lubon's testimony reveals is that their real, the real world counterpart for this case was anything but an inquirer. Instead, they were trying to fabricate a view of this concept of torture in order to impose that on the general population and the general institutional context because it served a political it served a specific political agenda it was irrelevant how for these um for these actors it was irrelevant how experts really came down on the question of how we should define torture and Lubon documents that in detail in the testimony showing all of these relevant precedents that that were overlooked by the authors of the torture memos so given that these speakers were in fact engaged in a conceptual dispute where they were motivated by non-inquiry interests, not trying to arrive at the best or correct view of this concept from the perspective of inquirers, but um, in order to serve certain non-inquiry interests such as political interests, they're engaged in what I call conceptual domination. So here's the, the more, um, precise formulation I give in the paper, speakers engage in conceptual domination when they aim to bring about and enforce widespread uptake for a view of a concept or set of concepts by exploiting institutions and institutional authority. They do so not because they are as inquirers committed to determining whether this is the correct or best view of the concept, but because this view of the concept serves their interests that are either irrelevant to or actively interfere with inquiry concerning this concept paradigmatically, but not exclusively, their material interests. And in fact, the example I just gave is one that's only kind of uh, more distantly related to the material interests of the actors. Instead, uh, it was about serving a specific political interests and agenda. Now, on my reading of uh, some of the previous literature on conspiracy theories, I see particularists as typically concerned to diagnose discourse around the concept conspiracy theory as a site and form of conceptual domination. So just to give a couple of examples, so from Husting and Orr's 2007 paper, they explain in both the academic and popular US press, the phrase conspiracy theory is a mechanism of exclusion that symbolically banishes questions, claims, and concerns so labeled from the public sphere as unwarranted or worse. From Basham and Dentith's 2016, we are facing a phrase conspiracy theory of social manipulation, one which some academics wish to portray and empower in a way so that it cannot impugn our hierarchies of power, but only defend them. So I think actually it's a particularly um, instructive case of conceptual domination, because the idea is that this is a concept that is not only being used and deployed by figures who have no interest in critically interrogating and reflecting on the concept, but it serves kind of a, a further function of stigmatizing um, those who are trying to uh, uh, treats them as sort of beyond the pale, treats um, those to whom the category or concept is applied as beyond the pale in terms of um, their ability to uh, genuinely contribute to political discourse. Now, interestingly, in their paper, Napolitano and Reuter give a much more specific and at least on my reading, I think it's a pretty misleading characterization of what particularists are concerned with. So they explain, that on their reading, particularists assume that the main function that the evaluative concept conspiracy theory plays in society is that of serving the interests of the powerful by discouraging people from investigating conspiracies. And I just think that when you actually look at particularist views, they're much more general. They're not just saying that this concept serves the interests of the powerful by discouraging people specifically from investigating conspiracies. So I think um, the view is much more general than that, and it's much more plausible than that. So let's just take some examples. So this is actually from the very first paragraph of Husting and Orr's paper. If I call you a conspiracy theorist, they argue, it matters little whether you have actually claimed that a conspiracy exists or whether you have simply raised an issue that I would rather avoid. So even in that very first sentence, right, they're not saying the function of this expression is to discourage investigation of conspiracies because they're pointing out that it's an expression that's being applied to people who don't even advocate for things that involve conspiracies. 
they continue as part of the machinery of interaction, the label does conversational work no matter how true, false, or conspiracy related your utterance is. Using the phrase, I can symbolically exclude you from the imagined community of reasonable interlocutors. Specifically, when I call you a conspiracy theorist, I can turn the tables on you. Instead of responding to a question, concern, or challenge, I twist the machinery of interaction so that you, not I, are now called to account. In fact, I've done even more. By labeling you, I strategically uh, exclude you from the sphere where public speech, debate, and conflict occur. So the particularist view, I think when you take a closer look at the literature is that the term conspiracy theory or concept conspiracy theory is a tool for marginalizing the views of those outside dominant positions of institutional power and authority. And I think it's, uh, this applies primarily to two sets of cases. So the first is that sometimes it applies to, is used to stigmatize in the way that we just saw Husting and Orr lay out, genuine dissident voices that are dismissed by the, via the label conspiracy theory. So here I'm borrowing again from Husting and Orr. They have a nice quote from uh, a Chomsky interview towards the end of their paper. And here's Chomsky describing his own experience. If you're in a faculty club or an editorial office, there's a collection of phrases that can be used, which are the intellectual equivalent of four letter words and tantrums. One of them is conspiracy theory, part of a series of totally meaningless curse words in effect, which are used by people People who want to shut you up. And I think that it can also be, and there's plenty of evidence to show, of course, that it's a term or concept that's applied to the voices of individuals with, it can be conceded, very odd, um, obviously false or warrantless beliefs. Um, but where those individuals are specifically ones who do not belong to or represent institutions that are dominant. So actually, before getting to that last point, so for example, um, uh, you'll see, you know, Sunstein and Vermeule in their 2009 paper point out that they have this very interesting caveat in the middle of the paper where they say, look, we know that states can be purveyors of conspiracy theories. We're just going to totally marginalize those cases and assume a well-motivated government. That's specifically their phrase. Um, and Kassam's book starts the same way, referencing the Bush administration's Al-Qaeda Iraq conspiracy theory, but then he doesn't discuss it in the rest of the book. So it's uh, on this kind of view, the term or concept um, serves to marginalize the views of those outside of dominant positions of institutional power and authority, even if those aren't necessarily genuine dissident voices. It's just marginalizing and stigmatizing those who aren't within the halls of power and authority. So on my view, um, I think there's a good case to be made that it's even a prime example of conceptual domination in the sense in which I've tried to um, articulate that concept. Now you might argue, okay, this is all sort of, uh, you know, very navel gazy meta philosophy. Why does it matter that we, that we get this right? Well, I think first of all, it matters because particularists on my reading, although those who, of you who um, identify as particularists should um, definitely uh, let me know what you think about this, but I don't think are obviously in the conceptual engineering business. I think that they're more so arguing we should abandon the evaluative component when or if we use the term conspiracy theory to avoid this kind of conceptual domination. And I think that that's crucially a very different project. That kind of abandonment is not the same as engineering a novel concept. And let me try and explain why, because on the face of it, it might seem that those are just the same thing. So let's go back to our friend uh, Noam from the previous slide. So this is from uh, an interview in the early 2000s with, with Chomsky, where he's talking about the term or concept rogue state. And he says to the interviewer something very interesting. He says, remember that I'm using the term or concept rogue state in a neutral sense in terms of its meaning. Almost every term in political discourse has a literal meaning and a propaganda version, and I'm using it in the literal meaning. The propaganda version, which is typically the one that prevails, that's the version presented by those who have the power to control discourse, propaganda, framework of discussion, and so on. 
And in that case, that means primarily the United States. As the United States uses the term rogue state, it refers to anyone who's out of control in the US's view. So Cuba is a rogue state because it does not submit to US domination. That's a different usage entirely. As I use the term rogue state, the leading rogue state in the world is the United States. That's the neutral term. Now, there's a question here about how precisely to interpret what Chomsky is saying. I think that Chomsky's position here is not really that we should be in the business of trying to engineer a novel neutral meaning for the term or concept rogue state, that that's what we should be spending our time doing as theorists. I think instead he's insisting on this neutrality in the context of this interview and in the context of his, his written work and uh, when speaking to uh, public audiences, He's insisting on this neutrality to demonstrate what's defective in the very concept itself. And I think what he's really getting at is that ideally we simply wouldn't use what is primarily a tool of propaganda, right? What we should, we can use it in this strategic rhetorical sense to show what an empty concept it is and how it is a tool of propaganda. Um, that for example, it, for example, it serves US imperial interest to have this term rogue state kicking around. Um, and then Chomsky can make the rhetorical move of saying, well, if we were to take this term literally and treat it neutrally, then of course it would apply more to the United States. And I think that that's an effective rhetorical move and it's helpful, but I don't think what Chomsky is saying is, okay, now what we really have to concentrate on is engaging in a detailed conceptual engineering project around the term rogue state. I think he would rather say, let's just ideally drop this term that is suffused um, with propaganda. So how might Napolitano and Reuter reply uh, to my criticism um, of their take on the literature and as we'll see their uh, conceptual engineering project? So first they might argue that particularists are simply wrong about the function of the term conspiracy theory. And they say this pretty explicitly in the paper. So they say that, you know, in per, especially based on the studies that they carry out, that the evaluative concept conspiracy theory is prevalent in ordinary thought and language, and attributions of conspiracy theory seem to be driven by an assessment of the target theory. So given that that's what, how the concept works in everyday thought and language, they conclude, thus the function that this concept serves in academic practices and discourses cannot be silencing warranted conspiracy accusations. I take it insofar as those academic discussions uh, are in the business of trying it all to track uh, the ordinary context where they're trying to say this, this function that particularists claim that the term serves um, are not actually in play in these ordinary contexts. Well, my reply here is that the function of a concept or a piece of discourse just need not be transparent to speakers themselves. And we, I think, could illustrate this with a number exam of examples. Um, but the most obvious example here is just slurs. So obviously, speaking of literatures where there's been an explosion in recent years of uh, interest in the topic, slurs uh, very much meet that description as well. But for all the disagreement, uh, philosophical disagreement that there is on slurs, there's very broad agreement that nefarious intentions or awareness of the function of such terms is not necessary for them to serve their characteristic function of, um, just to give the most kind of neutral general characterization, uh, 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 degrading various outgroups. So that in other words, right, even if I'm in uh, an ordinary speaker and I have no occurrent intention and maybe not even a subconscious intention, right, to degrade various outgroups. If I use a slur, the consensus among philosophers is that the term is still can still serve its slurring function um, and uh, likely does still serve its slurring function regardless of the speaker's intentions. So I don't think it's a very good argument to point to the fact that ordinary speakers or thinkers may not use this term with the uh, intention to marginalize perspectives that are outside of dominant institutional context because that intention just doesn't tell us anything, at least in my view, about the function of the term. Now they might push back against that response and they might argue, well, 
how could the function of marginalizing outsider voices and perspectives possibly come into play in the ordinary usage of conspiracy theory? Well, I'd refer back to a point that I made in passing earlier, which is that when an or ordinary speaker calls, say, advocates of 9-11 as an inside job or the moon landing was faked conspiracy theorists or calls those theories, conspiracy theories, whether they realize it or not, they're singling out cases of individuals outside of dominant institutions for special censure, even though I would argue that by the very criteria that they have in mind, this is a concept or category that if we're going to use it at all, applies much more urgently and clearly um, to those in positions of dominant institutional power whether it's Iraq Al-Qaeda, um, the conspiracy theory promoted by individuals within dominant political institutions, dominant media institutions, uh, whether uh, to take another example from the US scene, right, McCarthyism, both domestically and globally. Um, anyway, I have another paper on, on this topic, but the point is that this is a process, right, whether or not the ordinary speaker is aware of it, that feeds into the legitimation of existing dominant institutions, right, as the avatars of reasonableness, and raises the costs of dissent in, I think, just the way that particular, particularists, when we look at their actual accounts, uh, claim. Now, they might make a second totally different kind of response here. So Napolitano and Reuter might concede, fine, you know, maybe you're right about this stigma function, although they don't concede that in the paper, but suppose that they did in response to this kind of argument. Uh, say the stigma function is present in ordinary thought and talk surrounding the concept conspiracy theory, but they might nonetheless argue that this function is ultimately irrelevant because they say, the evaluative component of conspiracy theory is a feature of the meaning of the expression rather than a pragmatic implication of its use. So in other words, um, for ordinary speakers and thinkers, the negative epistemic evaluation is built into the very semantic content of the term conspiracy theory. It's So whatever the function of the term is, is just a matter of pragmatics, and they're just interested in the semantics of the term. Um, so I have a couple of replies here. My first one is, I think that this is just based on a view that, you know, at least in my reading of the literature and as a philosopher of language, I just think that very few philosophers of language hold regarding the relationship between semantics and pragmatics. I mean, one of the major themes of the last few decades in philosophy of language are so-called border disputes over the degree to which pragmatics intrudes into semantics or vice versa. And so just to give you a sense of this, for those of you who aren't familiar with these debates, here's Kasia Yashkoltz um, from her 2016 book, really excellent book, giving an overview of these border disputes. She explains that the kind of old fashioned Gricean view that there's the literal content of what's said, where that corresponds to semantics, and then what uh, is implicated where that corresponds to pragmatics um, is just a view that most people in the literature now reject to varying degrees. And so she explains that the onus of proof these days for philosophers of language seems to lie with those who like the fixers try to impose the privileged status on one of the aspects of meaning or one of the sources of information as the so-called core or pure meaning of the term where everything else can just be outsourced to the pragmatics. Instead, she points out the lexicon, grammar, recognition of intentions, recognition of goals and situation types, social and cultural conventions, general including scientific knowledge and other sources of contributing information have all to varying degrees been proposed as, and in her preferred view, are all equally important in communication and thus are equally important for representing meaning in communication. So in other words, I don't think that Napolitano and Reuter can respond here that, look, we just care about the semantics of the term and that's what we wanna engineer into the theoretical concept of conspiracy theory and we can leave all the pragmatics out of it because it's not clear what, uh, according to you know, recent accounts in philosophy of language, precisely what belongs in the semantics of a term rather than its pragmatics. Um, my second reply here would be that I also just don't think this is how philosophers should approach engineering projects, conceptual engineering projects. And I think we can see this by considering clear cases that would rightly give us substantial pause. In other words, when we have a concept that's been a site 
of conceptual domination in a very prominent way. And in the case of conspiracy theory, I think this is a key part of the particularist approach, right? To say that this concept um, has been involved in, uh, is a form of, often a form of conceptual domination in the way that it's discussed and used. I think as philosophers, we can't just say, well, look, that's part of the history of the term and it's specific cultural and political context. And we can just leave that behind and go ahead and leap into our engineering project. Because ask yourself the question, should we conceptually engineer the following concepts or terms? How about the concept enhanced interrogation technique? Well, sure, in the past that was used as just a euphemism to justify um, you know, egregious acts of torture, but perhaps we can just conceptually engineer that all away. I mean, I'm posing that question rhetorically as a kind of uh, reductio here. Or how about the concept military age male to stick with US um, security state and foreign policy concepts, right? This is a concept that's often used to justify um, massive civilian casualties carried out by the US military by just saying that any man whose military age within say uh, the radius of a drone strike actually doesn't count as a civilian, right? I think we should be highly suspicious of trying to turn that into a theoretically respectable concept. Okay, let me give some more, even more loaded examples. What about the concept welfare queen? Well, sure, it has an ugly history, but maybe we should just go ahead and conceptually engineer it. Or the concept manifest destiny, ugly history, maybe we should just be fine sort of dismissing that history in the relevant context and uh, jumping into an engineering project. So I think obviously my point is that in these cases, we're best off exposing these concepts as instances and forms of conceptual domination that is the use and deployment of them historically that we should then not try to engineer into respectable objects of inquiry other than say via quotation and historical that is to mention them not use them uh, in historical sociological or anthropological projects right? So we can still carry out theoretical inquiry. It's just quotation where we're not trying to use or engineer the concept in question. We merely mention it. Um, at the very least, I think we should be extremely careful if you don't want to go that far with me to account for the relevant historical and political context before jumping into an engineering project. So that's all I have. Thanks so much. Thank you, Matt. That was a great paper. As we wait for questions to come through, uh, this is more of a comment. So one of the reasons why I think this is a great paper is, of course, is you are defending work that I've done and other people like Jenna and Marty have done. So I have a vested interest uh, in support supporting your conceptual domination narrative here. Uh, but one thing which I think is interesting, so your paper is basically a response to the first third of Julia and Kevin's pa paper. I think there's a finding from the last third you can actually bring in to support your hypothesis because as part of the surveys that they engage in, they argue that we should re-engineer conspiracy theory so they're not even about conspiracies, that they apply to all sorts of other different things. And that kind of indicates precisely what you're saying here. This is a term that often gets used in discursive practice to basically, it, well, it, 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 it plays a discursive role whether or not there's a conspiracy involved. You call people conspiracy theorists, you call their views conspiracy theories in the hope they're going to shut up. The fact that their engineering project says, oh, we're going to actually, we're going to embrace the notion. It's not just about conspiracy theories indicates that they can't do the, we're only interested in the semantics and not the pragmatics approach. Their approach requires the pragmatics to do any of the work that they want to do for the conceptually engineered term. So I actually think you can take stuff from the latter part of the paper as support for not only do they not get the particulars right, but they end up kind of conceding the concept of uh, the particulars are right in a kind of weird way of going, oh, it, it applies to all these other things here, but we're going to embrace that rather than go, that seems like that would be inappropriate if that's the case. That's a great point, Em, and I, I hadn't thought about that. I was more kind of uh, thinking of, of that point in terms of how they get the particularist view wrong because 
right? Particularists will say, well, look, this term can serve the stigmatizing function, even if I'm not advocating for can anything involving a conspiracy. My view doesn't have anything to do uh, with the notion of, uh, doesn't invoke a conspiracy in any way, and yet I'm still being labeled a conspiracy theorist. But you're right that that's a problem for their move of trying to quarantine the semantics uh, from the pragmatics as well by their very own lights. Uh, that's another way in which they're going to struggle to do that. That's a great point. Thank you. I would say thank you for the wonderful defense of our of <laughs> our of our particular issue. Now we have a question from Martin here. Thanks, fascinating talk. I think you're right about the rhetorical stigmatizing function of conspiracy theory, but I wonder if you might overstate how unusual special this is. Wouldn't it apply equally to a phrase like pseudoscience or even the particular concept of conspiracy theory phobia, or indeed conspiracy communities dismissing each other as conspiracy theorists? In a way, isn't all of that trying to shut up your opponents? Yeah, that's uh, thanks, Martin. That's helpful. Um, I think I think I'm inclined to say, yeah, it is. It is a more general phenomenon, um, and I think I think I'm okay with that. I mean, I don't want to say that. So here here is a distinction I would draw. So in the case of um, the conspiracy, uh, the case of uh, the concept conspiracy theory. I don't think it's representative of this broader phenomenon of conceptual domination that I've written about generally. And so the reason for that is, so it, sorry, it still feels very weird to talk about my own, <laughs> my own work, but uh, in, the, in the actual paper, um, the, the cases that I give, um, I give the example, right, the torture case. Um, and I give another example of uh, the concept of how uh, the multi-level marketing industry has tried to impose a concept of pyramid schemes that would rule out the concept, uh, would rule out multi-level marketing from counting as a pyramid scheme. And on the surface, it looks like they're engaged in a genuine conceptual dispute. And then you look in the details and you see, of course, they have no interest in that. They have a vested material interest in a specific view of the concept. Now, what I would say is different about those two cases from the conspiracy theory case in the context of conceptual domination is that, you know, I think there is room for respectable conceptual engineering projects around the concept torture or the concept pyramid scheme. Um, whereas with the concept conspiracy theory, I'm less, far less convinced. Like I said, I don't want to in principle rule it out because um, I have some sympathy for uh, this project of conceptual engineering, but I think given the historical, cultural, political context surrounding the concept conspiracy theory, um, that it's, uh, it's harder for me to see what a successful conceptual engineering project would look like, um, such that the way we should protect against the conceptual domination that's involved in discussions and use of this concept uh, probably shouldn't involve an engineering project and should just involve kind of mere quotation um, and uh, strategic rhetorical use of uh, this, you know, the, the neutral approach of particularists uh, in the same way that Chomsky does for the term rogue state. Um, so anyway, sorry, that's a long-winded way of saying, yes, I agree. I think this, this kind of exclusionary rhetorical strategy is part of a whole set of uh, techniques that operate similarly. Um, uh, so I'm okay with that, but I would say that it's not, this example is one instance of conceptual domination, and I think in a very interesting one, but doesn't uh, capture that whole phenomenon, at least as, as, as I'm trying to um, uh, articulate it. So thank you. Sorry, I forgot I muted myself. So Curtis has an interesting exa example here. Would Joe Yusinski's conspiracy theories are for losers phrase count as an unintentional slur, loser being explicitly defined in an inoffensive way, and yet the damage is still done? Hmm, that's really interesting. So sorry, who, who, um, uh, where does that where does that phrase come from? I think you said M that it came from a specific author. Is oh yeah, so uh, Yusinski and Joe Parent use the term conspiracy theories are for losers to indicate that it's the losing side of a political debate, which comes up with conspiracy theories. So when they say loser, they don't mean loser in the 
pejorative sense, although they, it's a play on words, they mean the losing side. But as Cur Curtis points out, unfortunately, the phrase still sounds like conspiracy theories are for losers. Right, right. Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly open to the possibility that it's still serving a kind of slurring function insofar as, yeah, when you look at the slurring literature, intentions just play such a minimal or non-existent role in determining whether or not something counts as a, as a slur. Um, what, I, what I would say, um, what I would kind of add to that, though, and, and Curtis's comment reminds me of this, um, is that there's an interest, there's interesting room for Napolitano and Reuter to push back using my invocation of the slurring literature, which is that they could point out, right, well, wait a second, most accounts of slurs also want to leave room for the possibility of successful reclamation projects, right? So if you're going to draw on the slurs literature, you should also uh, concede that there is the possibility of successful reclamation. Um, and in a sense, like I said before, I don't want to rule that. I don't want to rule that out. But of course, what I what I would then also point out if they play with this, uh, the echoes with the slurs literature is that uh, most philosophers in that literature argue that it's going to be, it's reclamation is a hugely uphill battle. That's not to rule out um, the possibility of success, but it is to argue that it's extremely difficult. And then we should assess as theorists, you know, whether or not that's something we actually want to do with the concept of conspiracy theory. So I just wanted to add that further wrinkle to, uh, to Curtis's comment. Um, thank you. And our final question comes from Julia. A great paper. I'm inclined to agree with much of what you say, but wonder if specific instances of conceptual engineering can't also focus on a specific goal instead of trying to give a general conception that will be operationalize operationalizable for various purposes, and whether you think such specific engineering is problematic or not. Yeah, that's that's a, a really helpful. Uh, comment and question there, Julia. Um, I think I think I'm inclined I'm inclined to say that I agree with you, right? That there could be so if somebody really limits the goals that they have in mind for their engineering project, um, that that could uh, you know that could avoid some of the issues that I'm that I'm talking about here, especially if you're conceptual engineering in response to an instance of conceptual domination, if that's the way you're trying to deal with the conceptual domination, but. I would say that theorists also have to be really, really honest with themselves about how idiosyncratic those goals are. Because I think what you find in most cases, right, is that for conceptual engineering projects, they're not that idiosyncratic. They may be somewhat idiosyncratic, right? That's the whole reason to engineer that, you know, there are some purposes or ends that people have taken the concept to be answerable to that I just don't care about for my purposes. Um, but I likely have purposes and ends in mind that I think are going to be broadly shared among other theorists and philosophers, right? And if that's the case, um, then uh, I think that's something you just have to take into account, right? If you're if you're willing to say, look, my concept is just going to be so idiosyncratic um, that other philosophers and theorists are not going to have any interest in it, uh, well, then fine. But I just think that that's rarely what's actually going on in cases where people are especially self-consciously employing this, uh, this methodology. They still want it to have a pretty widespread uptake, but you're right that it's gonna depend on uh, the details of each case and of, of each theorist who may be willing to bite the idiosyncrasy bullet. 